Good afternoon and welcome to today's energy seminar. Um, today, um, I'm excited to announce our uh, speaker, Greg Mulholland from Citrine Informatics, uh, where he is the CEO and uh, co-founder. Uh, this quarter, uh, we're gonna end with four uh, corporate talks. Uh, interestingly, two from large energy companies and two from outstanding uh, successful entrepreneurs, rather smaller companies of which Greg is uh, uh, example number one. Um, I would like to give a little bit of background without uh, stealing Greg's thunder about citrine. Um, Greg himself uh, has a, a degrees in material science from Cambridge and electrical and computer uh, engineering from uh, NC State, uh, but also was a Stanford MBA. Uh, so right here at Stanford, I think the uh, team was formed and it was uh, the pathway to um, reality and the real world success that they've had uh, was helped by the innovation transfer program at the Tomcat Center. And in fact, Brian Bartholomew's was the first of many to recommend uh, Greg as a speaker. Uh, Greg, among many other honors, a young guy with a long uh, resume, um, is a member of the World Economic Forum Future of Production Working Group, was named the Forbes 30 to the Forbes 30 under 30 list in 2015 and was named a World Economic Forum, Forum Technology Pioneer in 27, uh, 2017. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, to you Greg Mulholland to talk about uh, his experience in uh, doing a very, in, uh, rolling out a very successful uh, energy startup, Citrine Informatics. Greg. Oh, well. John, thank you very much, and it's a uh, it's it's a real a real pleasure to be here. And I'm going to share my screen so folks can see. Um, it's it's a real uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. And you know, I, I think uh, you you highlighted it nicely. You know, the the foundation of Citrine really came from uh, some time uh, with with a, a classmate of mine at Stanford. Uh, we were both MBA students, um, and we both had this deep interest in material science. And and the reason we had such a deep interest in material science was was partly scientific. Uh, I'll admit there was there was a huge uh, motivation for me at least in this idea that. Uh, you know, we could use materials to really change the direction of, of humanity. And, and, I, and I mean that in no, no small way. Um, but I also, you know, I think our realization was that materials is a really big business. And, you know, it's like so many things, uh, if we can use the incentives and, and possibilities of the business world to transform some of the behaviors of, of the people around us and the companies around us, uh, we believe we could actually truly affect uh, a, a lot of change in the way we use energy and the way we use resources. So today I want to talk a little bit about where we got our start um, and, and what our philosophy has been and, and a little bit about what we do um, to use the, the science and technology and, and business that we picked up at Stanford and, and in other locations uh, to really try to change this, this incredible industry. So I guess to start with, um, you know, when I, the reason I got into materials in the first place was because I had a realization, actually, as you mentioned, was studying electrical and computer engineering. Um, and I had a realization that when I was doing transistor design, which was kind of my, my direction, um, that I was engineering around materials an awful lot of the time. And that my, my hope was that I could figure out a way, how can I use material science to make it so I didn't have to engineer around things. I could use materials to solve problems, not to be the limitation. And this led me down a really interesting path. Um, in particular, it, it became super interesting because there was this realization, this moment that I had, which was that materials really are the thread that connects every physical thing on earth. You know, and, and it, when we talk about this to materials companies, um, you know, I, I always say, you know, materials are the enabler or the limiting factor. Uh, when I talk to the rest of the world about it, what I like to say is, no one cares about materials. There's no one who cares about just materials. What we care about is what we can do with materials. And that's what makes it so exciting. Um, you know, for a long time, uh, we've always talked about kind of materials eras, right? You have the Bronze Age and the Stone Age. This is sort of the classic recruiting pitch to the material science domain, um, is that we name eras after materials, and that's how important they are. But I actually think we're really moving away from that in a pretty meaningful way. Um, and the reason I say that is because we've gotten so good with materials for so long that now when somebody invents something new, it doesn't revolutionize every industry. 
it revolutionizes one industry. You know, the, we don't have the invention of steel anymore where it just sort of takes over everything. But that actually creates a really cool opportunity for us. Because what we realize is that for a long time, we were trying to, you know, the material was our hammer. We were trying to use everything in every possible way. And in my world, uh, it was really more about this, um, you know, kind of how do we use the right material for the job. But before I get into that particular line of thinking, um, I want to touch on exactly why this is relevant to, to energy, because I think to a lot of people, the, the possibilities of the, uh, the possibilities of materials and how they connect to energy isn't always completely obvious. So the first thing I want to highlight is this, this image you see on the screen. It's sort of the, uh, the, the very high level of what is the life cycle of a material? Generally, you pull it from the ground, you, you design it, you make something of it, right? We don't use iron ore all that much anymore. We use iron ore that is then converted to steel or aluminum that's converted to steel, or sorry, aluminum that's converted to more advanced aluminum. Um, you then scale it up and manufacture it, make it into some intermediate thing, a, a sheet or a, a block or what have you. And then you hand it over to somebody else. You have an OEM company that starts to make a product. You know, Apple makes the MacBook or Ford makes the car. And ultimately, we get it into our hands as consumers. And what's really interesting to me, I'm about to go talk about all kinds of stuff with, with respect to energy. But if you look at each of these blocks on the screen, you can see that mining is an incredibly energy intensive activity. Making materials, smelting, purifying, and producing is unbelievably energy intensive. Making products, you know, actually making the final device uses a lot of energy and affects how energy is used tremendously. And so I'll talk a little bit about this, but our goal at Citrine is to connect the design of materials and the materials we can make with those end products and solutions that actually allow us to live in a more efficient, sustainable world. So when we started Citrine, actually, it, it kind of, you know, what, what really kind of shocked me into starting the company was actually a course I took when I was in my MBA program. And, and the course was talking about sort of energy flows and energy trading and energy markets. But what I realized was every area of materials or every area of energy is affected dramatically by materials. And so this is a, a Sankey chart that for those of you inter interested in energy, this is the 2019 one from, uh, from Lawrence Livermore. Um, this is probably something that's familiar, right? We, we generate the, the materials here on the left, or sorry, the energy here on the left, and then we use it in, in different ways, um, either good or bad, uh, over the course of its life. But what I started to realize was every stage of, of energy usage and energy creation is really affected a lot by the materials that we use. And I've come to understand this more and more. I mean, solar is probably pretty obvious, right? Solar cells are are basically just a couple of materials, um, and then you're trying to take the energy out of them. Um, but with nuclear materials, right, you're trying to optimize these things. Lighter, stronger blades. And there's an article in the New York Times about the most recent GE turbine that was released. That's it's for offshore wind, but it's just truly shockingly enormous. And what that does is it means you have to have super strong blades that can handle storms and handle their own weight and all these things. And the materials you make them from really matter. And then it turns out for even, even fossil fuels, uh, with the traditional fossil fuels, it turns out hotter is better. So you can burn cleaner if you're burning hotter, but there's a lot of problems if you start melting the metals your turbines are made out of, which is a thing that actually can happen. So what we realize is that in generation, materials are such an enabling, uh, enabling thing. And for those of you who are, are studying materials, studying chemical engineering, chemistry, or even, even systems, you can... This is not new, but for, for me at least, it wasn't new, but it was, it was shocking to think about the breadth of these technologies and how limited we are by the materials that we have today, even though we understand them so well. And by the way, this skips over all kinds of things like catalysis and recycling and all kinds of other energy intensive things uh, that, that can, can bring these things together. And if we look at where things are used, where energy is used, materials actually play a massive role there too. So, you know, I just use heating and cooling as a pr an interesting example. Um, you know, residential and commercial, like better insulation materials, better glass, uh, better roofs and, and these sorts of things to make sure we don't lose energy to the environment where we don't want to. 
I'll talk about agrichem in a minute, but we also talk about things like lighter, safer vehicles. It turns out that transport is a huge volume of our, of our uh, sort of energy consumption. And if we can make our vehicles lighter, the better off we are. And so I like to highlight a few things. First of all, the opportunities for materials innovation are truly enormous. Um, these are some, some shocking statistics for me. Haber-Bosch alone, so the process by which we make ammonia, consumes 5% of global natural gas, 2% of our global energy footprint annually, and generates 1% of our CO2 emissions every year. That's just an insane amount of, of energy. And when you think about it, it basically links this agricultural world and makes it a petrochemical product because of the amount of energy it consumes. Whereas there are people now doing work to try to create the same process, but using uh, catalysis, using a more efficient catalytic process so that we do consume less energy, but we still can feed the planet, which is obviously a huge priority for us. Cement creates 8%. That's almost a 10th of our global CO2 emissions. That's a crazy amount and actually will probably get worse as, as some developing economies accelerate and accelerate and build more and more. Cement is a huge part of that world. And so the opportunities to come up with new CO2 uh, efficient cement is huge. And I'm not gonna talk about the other two in depth, but just suffice it to say that everywhere we look, there are opportunities for more efficient energy applications by being lighter, stronger, hotter, more efficient, all the way around. These materials enable us to live in a way that, that is frankly quite, quite sustainable in a way that, that will allow us to survive uh, for many, many years. Um, in fact, there was at one time, Bryce, my co-founder and I, we were both at, GS, at the GSB. He said, is there a credible argument to be made that the story Citrine wants to tell can actually save the planet, can actually have a positive impact on both energy and, and environment broadly? And my assertion was yes because our goal is to accelerate the development and deployment of the next generation of materials and chemicals. And in my view, if we do not do that, if we do not come up with new materials to solve the problems we need to, sol to solve today, we are going to basically be extinct in less than 100 years. And so the faster we can do it, the better off we are. But it's not easy. And so here's where I'll talk a little bit about what we do and, and how I believe it's really changing things. So our industry, the materials industry, is constantly under tension, right? As you can probably, as you probably know, the, the development speed of these, um, of these, uh, these products, you know, these are companies, right? They want to get things into the market as fast as possible. But at the same time, they're always looking for the higher performance thing, right? And, and I think most of you who are involved in scientific research know that the further you're trying to push the frontier, the riskier it is and the longer it's going to take. And so we have this natural tension between performance, which can be sustainability, it can be efficiency, it can honestly be nothing to do with energy at all, right? It can be, you know, performance could just be, you know, the car drives faster. Uh, but I like to think of, of sustainability and energy efficiency as a, uh, as, a, as a performance characteristic as well and the product cycle demands of the worlds we see it today. So this development speed uh, is really a challenge. And here's the problem. And, and you might not think it's a problem at first, but the, the, uh, the real problem is we have more control over the materials that we make than we ever had at any point in human history. For those of you who work in, in materials or mechanical engineering or chemical engineering labs, you know that we can basically place atoms perfectly, one by one. I mean, it's not very efficient, but we can control materials incredibly well. And that's wonderful, except what it has done is it has given us a, a, new, uh, a new search space, a new set of haystacks. We have an entire planet of haystacks in which to find the needle that we're searching for. And that's a huge problem because if speed is our goal, then all of a sudden this new searching we can do is a limiting factor for us. We were relying on serendipity to get there. And so that's what Citrine set out to do. We set out to figure out how do we reduce the search space to just the most promising haystacks? And, and when we do that, can we actually create a new material that achieves a new goal? Because in my view, 
we're headed to a world of mass customization where we use the right tool, the right material for the job every single time. And to enable that, you have to know what your palette looks like. So before I go into exactly how we do it and exactly why it's interesting, right? because by the way, the best part about being an entrepreneur and the best part about uh, doing what we do is that not only do I get to work with materials, which is an, an industry I love and a topic I find fascinating, but I get to work with some of the best minds in thinking about AI for these scientific applications, which is obviously a really exciting thing to do. And so uh, this is this is the, the slight dilettante in me uh, saying that being a CEO of a startup is wonderful because you get to see a little bit of everything. So I always like to start at the end. So we were talking with a, uh, a company. Uh, it's actually a real project that we did with a major chemical company. And they were mixing two things together to try to create, it was actually, this is actually a, a, a catalysis problem. Um, so they, they were using a, a two-part catalyst and there were about 3.8 million candidate pairs they, they had come up with, you know, in, in different modalities, different combinations, different ratios, different shapes, all these sorts of things, a massive search space. And by the way, in our world, a relatively small one. So 3.8 million, it would take them roughly the rest of eternity to test that. And so they then, by bringing all their data together in our system, so we do two things. We bring materials data together, and then we use AI, specially tailored AI that I'll talk about in a minute, to help identify what materials hold the most promise. And they were able to down select to about 90,000 that were promising. Not, not the rest of eternity, but probably a, a good few scientists' lifetimes to test that entire space. We then said, well, we should be able to use computers to do this. We should be able to figure out how do we down select to even more promising materials. And we were able to immediately, just based on some real data science, it wasn't even true AI at this point, to about 27,000 materials. And then we put it in the automated system. We put it in the AI system. And it was able to select 76 of the most of those 3.8 million, the most promising 76. And then we realized we, you know, we took the list back to our, our collaborators and they said, well, actually, uh, these of these 76, 13 we've seen before. And so there were 63 materials in this in the sea of 3.8 million that had never been considered by this group and was actually uh, ultimately ended up hitting their performance goal. And so this is the goal. This is what we want to do. We want to enable this level of materials responsiveness all the way around. And so, you know, of course, this is where, you know, the presentation is basically over, right? We just, we have uh, AI to the rescue and here we are. But that's actually not true, right? You, you, you knew where that was going because here's the problem. You might've heard the, uh, the, the old saying, I guess old-ish saying, data is the new oil. Well, it turns out that's not exactly true because when people talk about big data and they talk about, they talk about AI and all the things we can do, and, and by the way, all these companies, many of which are within 50 miles of Stanford, doing this breakthrough AI work, what they fail to realize is their world looks very different from the rest of ours. So let me give you some examples. So we talk about data. We talk about huge volumes. So these are just, these are actually pretty old examples, right? 2014, Facebook was collecting on its users 46.3 gigabytes per second. Tesla in, in as of April 22nd, 2020, uh, had driven 3 million miles. And by the way, they basically collect video for that whole time. It's not exactly video, but they, they are doing a lot of data collection. I don't even know what that, that compares to in terms of on disk size. And Google is obviously collecting an enormous amount of data as well. And so this is really exciting, right? You know, these guys are doing amazing work and they're doing all of this, all of this thinking about what is possible. Why can't we apply that in our world? Well, I've talked to a company that had one of the largest product catalogs of any company we've ever worked with. And they had 100,000 products ever. That, that's, and that's not even in their product, like for sale product catalog. That is the number of things they have tested. And so even with that, this is the biggest number I've ever seen. It is 23 million times smaller than what your Facebooks, your Googles, your Amazons are working with. And that kind of makes sense, uh, at least makes sense to me, because 
when you start talking about new materials, new chemicals, new formulations, new paints, new coatings, uh, all of these things, a new test can cost a million dollars. Actually, it can cost $10 million. If you're talking about aerospace engine materials, um, you know, those can be really expensive to test. And so the reality of this industry, which, which is so critical to our success in, in being a more sustainable planet, is really problematic, right? Because there isn't that much data. So let me give you some examples of what the data scale is that we typically run into. We worked with a, a big, uh, well-known uh, adhesives company. And this company had about 2,000, was just, just shy of 2,000 products in their catalog. Um, we worked with Panasonic, you know, the, the, the company you probably know well, um, on a project that was incredibly successful. Uh, they started with 32 example molecules. And that's uh, obviously not a machine learning uh, normal number, right? If you go to Google with 32, 32 of something, uh, they're going to say, hey, we have a product for that. We can help you. And it's called Google Sheets because you can enumerate that almost on fingers and toes, right? I mean, that's just such a small amount of data. And we worked with a global petrochemical company who showed up with about 280 example formulations of, of one of their products. And so you end up in this place where the, the promise of AI, the promise of using computational power in the way that everybody talks about it in Silicon Valley isn't real to this part of the industry. And so you start to think about the materials and chemicals industry in a very different way. And, and the reason for that is that these companies, it's not that they're outmoded in that, you know, they've been, they've been leapt by other people. It's that their reality is very different from the reality that most of us think of in the tech world. And so when Bryce and I set out, we set out to say, we want to bring this new way of thinking to the materials and chemicals industry, but build it in a way that they can adopt. And this is one of the most important questions you can answer if, if you decide to start a company. One of the most important questions you can answer is, how do I uniquely serve my customer? Because if somebody else can do it the same way you can, you don't have something defensible. But if you have that insight that you can meet your customer where they are, you have something that can really change the world and, and you know, I think really create huge business opportunity and, and real technical opportunity. So as with anything, there's real challenges and opportunities here. So first, you know, some of you might know there's a pandemic going on right now. Um, that's why I'm not on Stanford's campus. Um, we have these, these challenges, right? We see in 2020, we saw the chemicals industry grind to a halt for two quarters and slowly start to come back. In Germany, they've talked about no recovery until 2022. And frankly, the, the EPA and regulatory bodies are starting to say, hey, these pollutants, these products that these companies are putting out are really challenging to the materials and chemicals or are really challenging to the environment. And so we need to start paying attention to that which in my view creates a huge opportunity. The CEOs of the global chemicals companies are starting to listen, frankly, to a lot of activist investors who are saying sustainability is the key to consumer preference and sustainability, whether it's in energy or in sustainable products, are things that, that people really um, want to see in the companies they work with. And of course, I'm sure all of you, especially those of you who are in the Bay Area, you, know, you see Teslas running around, but you know, now you see electric cars from VW Group, you see electric cars from GM, all of these new products that are, are ostensibly more sustainable have this big, big asterisk next to them. How do we make a battery that doesn't require rare earth elements? How do we make a motor that doesn't require rare earth elements? How do we make a battery that's recyclable? These things are tremendously challenging to the environment. And, you know, we're starting to even see oil and gas companies come around and say, hey, we're about to go the way of, of the dinosaur if we're not careful because consumers aren't going to want to buy our products and regulators are going to remove us from existence. So this is the context in which Citrine was started. We believed that there was an opportunity to help these companies change. And so we came up with one word that was so important, and that was agility. We started to believe that the best companies are the ones that could respond to a rapidly changing world. You know, as much as I would like to say we avoided climate change, we didn't. And so the world is more volatile than it ever has been before. And so this idea that a company isn't just 
the plant in the ground and that's all it is. It's a, it's a group of people that can learn and respond became our, our, our mantra, became the idea behind Citri. And so when Bryce and I started the company, we had this view that there was a way things were done today and there was a slightly different way that things would be done, done in the future. Today, scientists and, and engineers, for those of you who are in grad school and technical disciplines, particularly lab disciplines, you know, th the way you plan experiments, you probably feel like it should be something that can um, can change uh, or it can, it can be sort of more systematic as you get more industrial. I hate to tell you, my experience in industry was basically the same as my experience in grad school. It was very intuition driven. It was very personal. It was not a systematic way of making decisions. We believed that we should use data to make those decisions in a way that hasn't been done in the past. Very oftentimes, even strategic decisions made at the very highest levels are made based on kind of a scattershot approach. We believe you should rationally be able to determine what are your likely paths to success and, and actually attack them. Figure out where should I invest to have the most bang for my buck and have the most impact environmentally, or I guess least impact environmentally, depending on how you're thinking about it. And finally, I have been at companies where an adhesives group and a lubricants group work down the hall from each other and they never speak because this is an area where, where they, they don't do the same thing. And yet the physics of what they're doing is very related. And so our idea was if we started to bring these things together, we could start to create a really good uh, way of, of um, collaboration, actually create a scientific discourse in some of the world's best companies because these people have expertise and we need to take advantage of it. So the first thing, as I mentioned, is data. Well, the problem with materials and chemicals is that we know a lot about them, right? We, we understand structures. You know, there's some examples here of sort of hard segment, soft segment polymers. And the issue that we run into is that when we try to store materials data, we often just write down the things that we remember. So uh, we actually, a lot of times use baking as the example with, within citrine, because it's sort of something everybody kind of understands. And you might remember that, hey, I baked that at 350, but you might or might not remember that you were doing it at altitude, or you might or might not remember that you're using your mom's oven, which actually runs 10 degrees hot. Gathering that context is critically important in, in the context of a chemicals industry. And so we started by saying we needed to build a way to store chemicals and materials data. And this was great, right? We actually had someone with a computer science expertise join us and their, their earliest contributions were to say, how do I start to map these things? This is actually a screenshot from our system actually, where you can say, I have these ingredients and I'm mixing them together along the way to get one particular outcome. And what this means is you can actually start to put together all of the recipes you've looked at in the past and compare them truly. I had a, a, a mentor of mine who used to say, she was this Bulgarian scientist, uh, her name was Tanya Paskova, and she was one of the most brilliant people I've worked with. And in working with her, she used to repeat to me, Greg, you cannot compare uncomparable things, which at the time kind of was, it was sort of like an obviously, you know, sort of a, a tautology. But what it reminded me of is you have to constantly be thinking about how do the experiments you're putting together connect. And this allows us to be much more flexible in what we can connect than what other people might do in sort of a traditional approach. But that's not where we stop because data is the truest currency for AI. But in science, it's only a piece of the puzzle. It turns out that we have hundreds of years of expertise. And for those of you who live in the chemical engineering, material science, mechanical engineering, chemistry worlds, you know that you do not teach a student by putting a bunch of tables of data in front of them and say, hey, here, learn. You teach them the Arrhenius expression. You teach them the, the, the ideal gas law. You teach them all of these relationships that we have learned as a scientific community to give them a jump start. That is why we say we stand on the shoulders of giants. So at Citrine, we actually enable that in a very particular way. And we call it domain knowledge integration because expert teams at the world's materials and chemicals companies don't need to use data to teach these, these systems how things work. They actually have learned it themselves over many years. And so this allows us to integrate things like equation, 
rules of thumb, uh, business requirements, even cost, all of these things together where we understand trade-offs more explicitly than just data. And then we use data to better understand the non-idealities of those assumptions. So uh, it's a good way for those of you who think of it this way, uh, we can put the laws of thermodynamics in and let the data help us really learn the messiness of kinetics. And in a lot of ways, this is the way scientists ha have tried to work for, for centuries. The problem is the human mind can only hold so much internet at once. And so in our view, the way we will develop materials in the future is by using computers as leverage and actually enable better decision-making based on data that's been brought together, the knowledge you have as an expert, and the people around you who might be experts in different ways. So when we talk about AI, right, you know, you, I'm sure everyone on this, uh, on this webinar sees AI on a regular basis, either in hype or, or in practice. And at the end of the day, most AI is about finding similar things. So this is a goofy example, right? We have uh, we have this you know this this cat wrapped up, um, and the computer can figure out that, that is not a burrito; it is a cat. And great, we're all happy. In chemistry, we sometimes want to do that, right? We want to find how do I find the the lubricant or the adhesive or the paint that's ninety nine percent the same as the thing I sold last year, but 1% more efficient, 1% uses 1% less uh, toxic chemical, uh, or we remove phthalates or something, you know, some, some pretty strict target, but with a performance frontier that's pretty similar to what we've had in the past, because the, it does the job well. Well, this is something that we excel at. This is something that, we, that AI can really help with, because humans are bad at figuring out subtle relationships between things, and a computer is very good at that. So we can allow the human to elevate above the searching for the needle in the haystack and that we can enable that human to have five needles placed in front of them and then they get to choose which is the best one for the problem at hand. And so in some ways, this is the very easiest problem we like to deal with. But it turns out that most of materials in chemistry is not actually about finding things that are a lot like what you found before. For those of you who are in grad school, uh, try publishing a paper on something that is virtually identical to the paper that was published five years ago, uh, and it's not going to get through all that effectively, at least not without some really good storytelling and some pushing on the peer reviewer. Generally, what we want to do is we want to push the frontier out. We want to discover new things. We want to leverage ourselves. And so for this, we use a technology called transfer learning. And what we actually do is we bring data together with this domain knowledge, and it allows us to project out to say, here's what it would take to get five or 10 or maybe even 20% outside of the performance frontier that we have today. And that's a really cool thing to do, right? Because it gives us the opportunity to actually branch beyond uh, the, the, what we're exactly what we see today. And it gives us the opportunity to optimize into new space. And so building on these relationships as we go with time, as we learn, we can teach the computer more and more. And they can say, here's a recipe that I believe is going to make you successful in achieving your next goal. And, and for us, that's scientifically interesting. I think it's really important for uh, the, the energy economy because whether it's storage or generation or even, or even use, um, it's, it's so critical that we be able to refine things and make them better over time. And so scientifically, that's fascinating. But you might know that, you know, especially since I got my MBA and they sort of pounded it in my head, you have to create an incentive for people to actually use this stuff right? Because I can have the best science project in the world, but it turns out a science project is not what most companies exist to do. And so we had to come up with a way to articulate this to the materials and chemicals industry that quite frankly, at the time, this is in 2013, was not that adopting of new digital technologies. And things have changed somewhat now, but at that time, people looked at us a little bit like we were crazy. And so we realized there were five ways that this thing could help. The first is kind of what I described. It's you know the faster product development, uh, the the faster product development angle. Can we actually get new products into the uh, in, into the market faster? The second is regulatory resilience. You know if if you Europe has been talking about outlawing plastics full stop, which 
clearly they don't understand that would sort of send us back to the stone age, but the, you know, sort of regulating plastics out of the environment is going to be very challenging. And if companies can, can actually respond and replace those plastics with biodegradable versions or lower energy versions or more sustainable versions, that's better. One thing we saw this year was huge supply chain disruptions as COVID moved around the planet. We ran into issues with so many factories shutting down that many companies had to reformulate their products, not because they wanted to, but because they couldn't get their ingredients. And so just like when you go to, uh, when you go to the, the grocery store and you pick up flour and you get home and you realize you grabbed the wrong stuff and you start Googling, how do I replace all purpose flour with bread flour? That's, think about doing that at an industrial scale at a plant in Houston. This is something that companies had to do within weeks uh, of COVID hitting and, and starting to see shutdowns happen. And then finally, uh, you know, dollars and cents is where it's at for these companies. So being more responsive to your customers and being able to optimize cost out of your supply chain were really, really important. So I want to talk about two quick case studies, and they'll be very quick, a minute each. This is one of our proudest uh, projects. Uh, we worked with HRL Labs. Uh, for those of you who, who were around, you might remember Hughes Aircraft. This is the, this is the research lab that spun out of Hughes Aircraft, um, which is now owned by Boeing and GM. And they're trying to create 3D printable aluminum powders for aerospace, so to make planes lighter. How do we print parts that are exactly the right shape such that we can uh, create a better, um, a more efficient plane, a faster plane, wh whatever your goal is. And this group needed to search 11 and a half million additives that they could put into this, this powder. And, you know, the, the result was that they got down to about 100. Um, they were able to use our, our platform to get down to about 100. And then they disappeared, quite honestly. Um, when we started working with them, you know, they, they got down to 100 and then they wouldn't tell us what they were doing. And they, they just disappeared. And, and two years later, we got a call and they said, you know, Greg, this is uh, the nature paper comes out next week. And I looked at my co-founders and we said, well, what are you talking about? We, we don't even know what you're doing. And they said, oh, we just created two new 3D printable aluminum alloys for aerospace. And that was really exciting. Now they're selling it to NASA. So this is a commercial product today. And what was really cool, I mean, this is, this is the, the guy who was doing this research who at the time, I think was a PhD student and is now uh, quite senior. Um, he said what would have taken years, Citrine narrowed it down to days. And the reason that's so important is that when an expert tells you that it works, you can really believe that it works. Um, and for me, that was so important because, you know, it, it was always, it was an idea that Bryce and I had. And we demonstrated it early. I'll talk about that in a minute. But really, when we talk about the, the impact, having someone who does alloy development professionally confirm that it works to us was such a huge breakthrough for us as a business. And it really was the, the foundation upon which we built a lot of our early decisions at Citrine. So the other example I'll give is a new class of thermoelectrics. And this was a goofy one. We actually, this is before Bryce and I started the company. Um, we were students at, at the GSB and we, in the summer between our two years, we said, we're gonna try to see if this can work. We have this idea, we're gonna see if it works. So we started a partnership with a group at, at UCSB down at Santa Barbara. Uh, they had a, a kind of a database of thermoelectric materials, which if you don't know, they, they use them to make refrigerators. They, you can apply a voltage and make things cold, or you can uh, absorb heat and uh, put off a voltage. And we were able to, with technology that was substantial, substantially less fancy than what we use today, we were able to show that we could invent not just a new thermoelectric, not just two new thermoelectrics, but an entire new class of thermoelectric materials. And... Ultimately, we had it demonstrated by synthetic scientists. They actually made the material and it worked exactly as expected. And so this for us was, was proof that AI can actually drive this change. And in an energetic materials class, which for both of us was very exciting. So I want to leave time for questions. But, you know, I think this is a case of, you know, an opportunity being created, not because of you know, a scientist sitting in a room thinking about their one thing. Um, I believe that the best opportunities come from boundaries. And Citrine exists the boundaries of energy efficiency, sustainability, um, the bound with, with uh, computer science and AI, 
with materials and chemistry. And by bringing these together in a way that really no one else has been able to, we've established ourselves as, as a real leader in the space. And so as you're thinking about how to go solve these problems, I'd encourage you to think about them this way. No one is ever going to solve a problem, at least not the world's hardest problems, by running at the problem in the same way everybody else has done it. You have your own experience, you have your own view. And if you can combine all of those aspects of, of your knowledge and come up with a unique approach, that is the thing that's going to lead you to success. And frankly, it will lead you to the most interesting types of success. So with that, I, uh, I think we have a, a little bit of time for questions now. Um, thank you very much. I hope this was interesting and uh, it's been a real honor to, uh, to, to speak to all of you. So uh, great, thanks a lot. That was uh, really terrific. I, I expected to see a uh, state-of-the-art entrepreneur uh, startup dude and you fulfill that, but uh, much more than that for me, I now understand why you're a World Economic Forum superstar. Uh, you were able to uh, wrap into this talk, which I thought would be more technology worded, uh, massive uh, insights regarding strategy and even the way uh, we think about doing policy analysis, which is what I spend most of my time doing. Uh, so we did get a number of questions, keep the questions uh, coming. Um, so uh, one precursor student who I know pretty well, uh, ha actually had two questions right out of the box. Um, what are sustainable alternatives to cement, if you know that, and then maybe more generally, uh, how can developing countries contribute? Are you working with people in developing countries who might have a different perspective and a different way to use materials than we do in the developing world? Yeah, yeah, happy to. So so it, I think with, with concrete, I would say it's, it's less uh, a sustainable alternative to concrete and more sustainable versions of concrete. I mean, concrete is truly unique in its, in its, uh, its, its own sort of capabilities, right? You know, there's a reason that we've used it since Roman times. Um, it's less about that and more about the way we make it. We haven't really changed the recipe all that much. And so rather than thinking about it as replace it wholesale, there are many companies now working on low CO2 emitting, basically when it cures, uh, can, you, can you figure out how to make it not emit so, so much CO2? And that's, that's a reaction kinetics problem. Uh, it's a materials problem. Um, there's a lot of uh, very, um, very interesting, interesting problems there. Um, the, the, sort of thinking about developing countries is a fascinating one, actually. A classmate of mine uh, at the GSB, uh, even though she's not a materials person, started a materials company, whether she likes it or not, that's what it is. It's a company called Earth Enable. And um, it's this idea of, they use local materials to create hardened floors uh, in, I believe they're, they're, they started in R Rwanda and now have branched out. Because one of the major uh, public health problems uh, in that part of the world was that parasites could come up through the floors because they were they were dirt floor huts. And so they came up with a way to integrate these uh, the, some material into the into the, the floor of the hut, tamp it down and it made it an impermeable surface. And so you know this was a case of you know thinking about what do I have access to in my own space that I can use sort of very locally to solve a very immediate problem. And I think you know when we talk about um, concrete's actually the perfect example, the biggest cost in concrete is transport. And so when we talk about this reformulation problem, um, the opportunity that we have at Citrine is to say, look, you know, Brazil's lime is different from the US's lime, which is different from China's lime, which is different from the lime, you know, dozens of types of lime over, over the, the total area of Africa. And so being able to respond to those and come up with the right materials for the local environment, reduce on transportation costs, reduce on transportation pollution, and lets us create the right thing at the right moment, which you know, I think there's a lot of, of difficult things about the on-demand economy we've created, but I actually think in the materials world, the more on-demand we can be, the better, because it, it does really mean we have a lot less wastage. And so hopefully that answers your question about the, uh, the developing world. It's, it's, a, it's a fascinating topic that I'm, I'm starting to get deeper on it as we speak. Terrific. Uh, yeah, then probably you hear this a lot. Uh, people were fascinated by your use of the term agility as kind of a comparative advantage type uh, killer thing and moving into transfer learning in particular. So I have a, my own simplistic version of the uh, question about agility, which covers a couple of others. And that is, in, in your view and experience, is it, is, it, is it about the people? Is it about the technology, how you use the technology, the business models you use, all the above, none of the above, or something completely uh, different? 
Yeah. So, so, I mean, I think business model is sort of a price of admission. You have to figure that out. And, and honestly, we get pushed all the time on whether ours is the right one because everybody looks to pharma, right? Everybody wants you to patent the billion dollar thing and then go sell the billion dollar thing. Um, and it turns out our, our industry is pretty different from that. And there are, there are, uh, the, the path before us was littered with sort of the corpses uh, or, or still existing companies, but, but some companies sort of tried and failed to, to build some kind of crazy business models around this stuff. And we're a pure software company. So it's, it's a very straightforward thing. The bigger question, though, I think if you have a good solution, your business model, you can sort of iterate with it. For us, the problem is the culture of the chemicals industry. You know, things have been done the way they've been done for hundreds of years. And trying to convince someone they need to change things, if you do it the wrong way, just just insulting, right? It's like, you don't want to go in and say, you guys are idiots, because they're not. They're brilliant people who are the best in the world at developing new chemicals. I'm just teaching, I'm just saying, hey, you know, rather than trying to lift the car with your bare hands, I've got a jack. So why don't I show you how to use that? And people start to understand that this becomes a source of leverage for them. So, you know, I always talk about uh, people, process, and technology as sort of the three things you need to change. And I think you can't avoid any of them. And it turns out that we in Silicon Valley are kind of the best at technology. I mean, that, that's, what, that's kind of where we excel. And we've, you know, my team and I have had to learn how do we help coach these companies to adopt new, new cultural practices, new, new processes, so that they can adopt the technology in the most useful way possible. So uh, terrific. Uh, another um, similar question. I, I think all of us at Stanford uh, who are not in computer science uh, at times feel totally overwhelmed as in the Borg uh, through line in Star Trek uh, about AI data science and machine learning. I have a lot of friends over there and I think um, we would do, they would do better and we would do better if we work collaboratively. And it seems like you've definitely come to that conclusion in a, in a very tangible, meaningful way, as opposed to me, who mostly theorizes about such things. So how, how have you found that? Uh, so if I remember that part of your talk, it was really about not just the data, but the quote unquote expertise that we have by going through all our long uh, years of engineering education. Could you, could you expound upon that a little bit more? And uh, it, have you been able to work uh, in a collaborative way with data science people? Actually, you would be the quarterback in between the data science people and the people who stayed for the PhD in materials or whatever. I don't know. Yeah, so, so, so that's exactly what we do. You know, I, I, I like to say we are not, uh, you know, if you want to go work for the most cutting edge AI company, it's probably not us. There are lots of companies that are doing really cutting edge stuff. And if you want to work for the world's most pure materials company, that's not us either. Um, we don't make materials. We're only a software company. But, um, you know, what I've found more and more is that nobody, I mean, there are people who go into data science who are just, you know, sort of chasing a paycheck. By and large, I don't see that. I, I see people who want to use these tools to have a great impact. And, you know, for, so for some people, that's better advertising or, or better Netflix recommendations or whatever it is. But a lot of times people come to a, a talk like this and they say, actually, I want to use my skills to, to advance the world, to change things for the better. And, you know, a lot of times that core motivation really creates a nice bridge between the what I call computer science technical people versus the chemistry technical people. And I think then, then it's just a matter of teaching them to facilitate a discussion with each other, um, teaching them the same language so they can actually communicate. And once we do that, it's usually just beautiful harmony. Um, bumps here and there, but, but I think in general, it's, uh, you know, people want to have impact. You know, that's what this generation is all about. And I think uh, giving data scientists a, a, an on-ramp into doing that in an industry where, where a lot of people overlook what an impact it has um, really motivates people to, to do a lot of cool stuff. I can't resist. I, I remember, uh, like it was yesterday, a talk I saw with the, uh, in the uh, Entrepreneurial Thought Leader Series, our kind of sister Wednesday seminar, by a young guy, probably not much older than you, named Jeff Bezos, who said the reason people think we're going to fail almost immediately, like Barnes and Noble, is they think we're a book company. There's no way we're a book company. We're an IT company, and they have no idea that that's what that's what our game is. So it's kind of an interesting, very uh, precocious, probably for him, for him for sure, and probably for you as well. Actually, we're kind of running out of time. So as a transition, as I usually do, I wonder you've done a lot of this during the talk. Do you have any last words of wisdom and advice to give students who are interested in getting into your uh, part of the uh, energy and sustainability future of the world? 
Well, you know, I, I'd say two things. The first is, you know, for those of you who are who are interested in materials, who are interested in data science in materials, come and talk to us. Um, you know, this is a this is an exciting area, and we want more great people that you know to come work. So that's my that's my shameless recruiting pitch. Um, you know, we're, we're hiring all the time. Um, I would say, you know, if you have an idea. Um, first of all, I, I did not come into this believing that I wanted to start a company. I actually, I don't, I worked at a relatively small company. I'd suffered the pain and I honestly went to, had planned to go uh, work for one of the big tech companies. And what I realized was I had a calling to do this. And, and I realized I had an insight, right? This boundary problem of how do you do AI and materials at the same time? I saw something a lot of people didn't see. And so my, my exhortation to you would be, don't just go try to do something because it's there. Do something where you really believe you have a different perspective than the rest of the world, because that's your biggest opportunity to have impact. And I mean, you know, yes, I, I would love to be Jeff Bezos, at least the, the money aspect, like, you know, richest person on earth. But, you know, honestly, he found a scene that no one else had seen. And, and I believe we have too. And so, you know, as you're thinking about how you can change the world, um, you know, it is my belief that it's these overlaps, these boundaries that create the greatest opportunity. And, and it's been a huge honor to, to be able to share it with all of you. So thank you very much for your time. And, and John, thank you for inviting me. It's been a real oh, pleasure. Thank, thank you so much. We look forward to welcoming you on campus as soon as we're able to, uh, to do that. Uh, and actually on your uh, comment about uh, materials being exciting, if people didn't think that uh, before the seminar, I think they probably do now. So thanks once again for a terrific, uh, inspiring and uh, impactful seminar. Keep up, keep up the good work, as they say. We need you. <laughs>